Hello. I hope you're doing well. So today we're going to start a new module. Um, in fact, it will be related to the variational principle. And it's basically made of two main lectures. The first one is an introduction to the theory. And the second is going to be more practical in terms of examples of how to find, say, an upper bound to a given ground state for a problem. Um, so let me share the screen to introduce you to the topic. Okay. So, so I mentioned this first lecture on variational principle with which we opened the module. It's going to be an introduction to the theory and a side introduction. Today, we're also going to touch base with the method that is inspired from the variational principle, which is called Rayleigh-Reed's method. Some people also call it a variational method, but I mean, it's fine. Um, I think basically there's just one distinction. The variational principle is a theorem that I will show in, in a second. And the method is basically um, some sort of optimization technique to be um, completely defined. So let's talk first about the principle, right? The variational principle. So basically the problem is the following. You want to estimate the ground state energy of a given Hamiltonian, but you don't want to solve the whole eigenvalue problem for Schrodinger equation. So what you can do is to, well, obtain an upper bound uh, for the ground state by means of the following theorem, which is the variational principle. And although this is an upper bound, um, it can become an approximation to the ground state if you choose uh, appropriate function. So again, the bound, although it's an upper bound, can be close um, to, to the ground state value that you want to figure out, provided that you make good choices to be defined. And again, uh, the formal statement of the variational principle, which is a theorem that we're going to prove today, is that for any normalized wave function, it holds that the energy of the ground state is less or equal than the average value of the Hamiltonian calculated over any normalized wave function. Okay, so that's important. Um, it takes time to sip it out, but actually it's quite intuitive when you think about it and look at the theorem and the proof. Uh, because look, uh, these are my following arguments to try to motivate why this result holds, right? So let's assume that you we're actually in the ground state, that psi was the wave function for the ground state. Actually, then you would have an equality, right? The thing is you don't want to solve uh, the full eigenvalue problem. So you don't know what psi looks like in principle. So on the other hand, if you were at an excited state, even if you don't know because you can't solve the problem, you don't know the exact form of psi, you know that this inequality would be strict, meaning that it would be, this would be strictly greater. Because, well, if you were to be at the, say, first excited state or upper states, uh, the eigenvalue is greater. I mean, that's from Sturm Liouville theory in terms of how they order, and you're assuming that you're not at the ground state, even if it's degenerate, you know? So, I mean, this is just, in case you were in the excited state, but you don't know that. I mean, the point of the principle is not only to restrict the stationary states, but to talk about wave functions in general, basically any state, and this holds. And so psi doesn't need to be a, a stationary state, yet this inequality holds. And usually later on, after we prove the principle, We'll just inquire that in a way our form of getting close to the ground state, although this is an upper bound, is to choose appropriate wave functions that resemble what we expect the ground state to look like, pretty much. But okay, first let's prove the theorem. I think I have tried to motivate it first by thinking what would happen if we are at the stationary states. Although this holds in general, and I'm going to present the proof and then I'll make some comments on why actually 
this result is very natural coming from averages, actually. So, well, even if we haven't solved the eigenvalue problem, we know that there is a solution provided the assumptions in storm Liouville theory are satisfied. And even if we don't know them, the stationary states with their eigenvalues exist. And therefore we can express any wave function in terms of the complete basis of Hamiltonian eigenstates that we don't know, but that they exist. So psi is a linear combination of the eigenstates with these coefficients. And each one of the eigenstates uh, satisfies the eigenvalue problem of Schrodinger equation, where, okay, this is the eigenfunction, this is the eigenvalue, right? So far, so good. Now, I mean, what you also know from the postulates of quantum mechanics and this interpretation of the wave function is that the expected value of a measurable quantity and observable is the average over the normal eigenstates times the probabilities. And the probabilities, which is also part of these postulates of quantum mechanics, is the norm squared of the amplitude coefficients. So, I mean, we actually, we actually can prove this quickly, but that's the interpretation, right? Essentially, let's say that I wanted to get the average of the Hamiltonian over the wave function, which can be expressed in general as linear combinations of eigenstates. So, we would have this, then plugging in the form of the wave function as in this linear combination, we have these two, and we simply have to apply the Hamiltonian operator um, to this linear combination, which because you have eigenstates as um, partial terms in the sum, well, you'll only retrieve an energy eigenvalue for each one of the um, eigenstates. And at this point, this is just a matter of linear combination center of orthogonality, because well, using linearity, you're gonna take out the sum with the coefficient then you have this, then you basically use the sesquite linearity uh, in the left uh, side of the inner product, which is why you get a conjugate in this case. And then you have these inner products, but you know that your basis is orthonormal by assumption. So, I mean, essentially what you get is a Kronecker delta, which compresses all these terms into only C and conjugate or C and star. And at the end of the day, I mean, since this sum reduced to a single term, what you have is the sum of EN times uh, uh, norm of CN squared. Sorry, I'm getting a call, but I'm not going to answer it. Um, so again, uh, CN norm squared is uh, basically the probability uh, of being in each um, uh, eigenstate. And so the result of this calculation, which you probably saw in your first quantum mechanics course, is that the average value of the Hamiltonian over a given wave function state is pretty much an average because this is the energy of a given state N. And this is basically the probability weight of being in that state. So in that sense, this calculation is an average, right? These are the sets of possible values you can take, which are the eigenvalues or the energy eigenvalues. And this is the probability or the weight uh, that we give to each state given the probability of being on it. Um, yeah, here we just um, iterate that we know by assumption that psi is normalized. So basically the calculation of the same type as above actually without the H operator will be uh, implemented where, well, the norm squared of this is one. So you plug in the wave function uh, actually, I may have something repeated here. Um, then you simply use linearity, then you use sesquite linearity, then these are Kronecker deltas due to orthonormality conditions. And therefore, this is reduced to a single term, and this is just the sum of norm CN squared. So, which is pretty much indicating also that these are probabilities, and the sum of all probabilities is one. So again, um, so far we haven't assumed that we have solved the problem from Sturm, uh, say the eigen problem, but there are some things that we know from Sturm Liouville theory, which, well, we know that under the uh, reasonable assumptions, there is a ground state that, um, well, it's related to the smallest of the eigenvalues. 
and the ground state therefore, or the energy of the ground state is less or equal than all the other eigenvalues. And of course you get equality when you're actually in the index representing the ground state, right? So this is because we're gonna implement this inequality in one of our terms above where we have that the average of the Hamiltonian is basically precise and average over the probabilities. And then this is less or equal because EN is greater or equal than the ground state <clears throat> by plugging in the ground state energy instead of EN. Uh, but this term is constant. And so it can be pulled out of the sum. And therefore you get the sum of these, but these are sums of probabilities, which is equal to one. And you simply get the energy of the ground state. So, I mean, the result is obtained at this point, um, of course, because you have assumed that psi is normalized as well. So basically the result is that for any wave function, assuming it's normalized, the expectation value of uh, the Hamiltonian over that, uh, that wave function state is greater or equal than the energy of the ground state. So, well, the intuition followed from the arguments in the paragraph above regarding stationary states. We proved that it holds in general. And actually the proof is quite intuitive. And I mean, it totally makes sense if you think that when you calculate averages, say of an operator such as the Hamiltonian, what you're doing is pretty much compute an average over the states and giving weights related to their probabilities via these coefficients. So if you're basically taking an average over a list of possible values, which in this case, it's an average over energy values because you're computing the average of the Hamiltonian, clearly the average can never be below the minimum value on that list, which is the ground state. So it totally makes sense that the average is gonna be above or equal to the minimum value in the list, which is the energy of the ground state. So, I mean, of course the calculation is nice. It takes some time to get the intuition of the proof, but once you see what you have calculated, which is pretty much an average of the Hamiltonian in terms of the possible states and their probability weights, then it's clear why the average uh, of the Hamiltonian should be greater than the minimum value. So uh, at this point, the calculation is reduced to simply properties of averages. Um, so uh, let's see, what else do we have to say? Well, yeah, I mean, most of the proof has been sketched, uh, sketched sorry. Um, I guess the only thing that has to be properly mentioned is, um, well, Psi has to satisfy some properties. Of course, that it's normalized, which we emphasized, but also that it belongs to the Hilbert space, right? right? And so, I mean, I'm not gonna go too much into um, the detail of this because this is not a functional analysis course, but essentially I might just point out what could go wrong which one possible or possibly bad candidate for wave functions is basically a discontinuous function because the second derivative might have issues. Uh, however, um, I'm just gonna sketch why continuous functions uh, with kings at a point, say like a 10th function, basically like some sort of uh, transformation of the absolute value, let's say, um, well, basically if it has a kink, like in say uh, a shifted absolute value uh, or a triangular function, that is like a 10th function. <clears throat> well, it might not be differentiable at the point where it has the kink, right? At the peak, but well, essentially the derivative is defined except uh, or up to a point. And in that case, uh, for that particular function, the derivative is discontinuous, the first derivative, and the second derivative might be some sort of Dirac delta. So in the first case, you have basically a discontinuous function as first derivative, and in the other, you have a distribution, formally speaking. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, the discontinuous thing is a heaviside function, and the second derivative would be a Dirac delta, which is actually a distribution, not a function. But for the purposes of storm level theory and Hilbert spaces, um, this is okay. It can be matched. The other case is more pathological where your wave function might be discontinuous, but 
continuous functions with kings at a point, it might not be too much of an issue, quite frankly. So, okay, after that clarification of basically which wave functions belong properly in the Hilbert space, although this has been done heuristically very hand wavy, I mean, um, the, this formality would probably belong to a functional analysis course and that's perhaps not the scope at this point. But okay, what we have done so far, is basically introduce the theory, present the variational principle, prove the variational principle, give some intuition before and after the proof. And now what we're gonna do is to present um, method to calculate approximately the energy of the ground state uh, inspired on the variational principle. And that is uh, called the rayleigh reeds method or the variational method. Uh, both names are pretty common in the quantum mechanics community, so it's fine. So why do I say that it is inspired on the variational principle? Well, because look, at this point, what we have before is a bound, right? And so what you want is on one hand to calculate at least an upper bound for the ground state, have a limit on its value. But on the other, provide um, reasonable approximations to the wave functions such uh, that this calculation of the average of the Hamiltonian over that state is not too far away from the ground state energy. So there are two components. One gives you the bound, the other is in a way to choose uh, psi so that it's as close as you can to the ground state with the choices that you have made for the wave function. And basically what you're gonna do is that you are gonna propose a family of normalized functions that intend to approximate the ground state eigenfunction. And this family of functions is gonna be defined by parameters. Um, and what you're gonna do essentially is to look for the specific parameter values that give you the minimum average energy over the family of functions considered. And that's basically your best possible candidate for, uh, well, it's not the ground energy because again, we saw that it's a bound, but it's the best possible candidate that you can give over your family that is as close as you can given the family you chose to the ground state. So it might not be the energy of the ground state exactly, but it's as close as you can get given the functions that you propose. So again, by assumption, we will uh, know that these uh, wave functions are normalized. Usually it's just taking care of normalizing them before you start the problem. And assuming that they are normalized, uh, the expected value of the Hamiltonian, it's basically the average of the Hamiltonian over these wave functions, right? And so this uh, energy is a function of the parameters. And again, uh, at this point, since you haven't solved the eigenvalue problem, you're just proposing a family of functions and the best candidate that you can propose over your family to mimic, or it's not gonna be the ground state, the most probably not, unless you're very lucky or you actually know the form of uh, the wave functions beforehand. But the best candidate that you can propose over your family to basically mimic the ground state or as good a guess that you can give, although it will be an upper bound, but you want to be as close as to the ground state energy value is precisely the one that minimizes the energy in the set of functions uh, considered. Um, you can think of the family of functions as a space. We haven't said that it's a vector space. It really depends on the family that you propose. So no claim on that uh, until you define more about the family. It's basically just a set of functions defined by parameters. So at this point, your best candidate uh, is the function whose values, whose parameter values that I identified are the ones that minimize the energy over the family of functions considered. Um, and well, at this point, when you talk about uh, minimizing problem over a scalar function, which in this case is the energy uh, over, let's say some parameters, basically this becomes uh, some sort of uh, calculus in a singular multiple variables optimization problem, right? 
And there, you know that you have to look for critical points and to look for minimizers at the boundary and then compare the values to determine which one is the best candidate. So again, what you'll have to do is to basically calculate the gradient of the energy in terms of these parameters, make it equal to zero and solve the system of equations that comes from the vanishing of the gradient and uh, then obtain the parameter values that uh, satisfy the critical point conditions and compare with possible values at the boundary. So this is pretty much an optimization problem that you have seen in calculus. There is not uh, too much difference. I mean, of course, assuming that the number of parameters is finite, if not, uh, things uh, become more complicated. But, well, excuse me. Um, this is a typical optimization problem in calculus and solving it uh, will give you the parameters for which the function in the family has the lowest energy. So that will be your best candidate provided the family of functions that you chose. There are some more formal names uh, for these families of functions that I will say in a second, but uh, I just want to present the idea at the beginning. So, um, well, yeah, some words about the number of parameters. Uh, Basically, it depends on the family of functions that you are um, taking, depending on the problem of interest, right? So just to give an example, uh, let's say that you want to give an approximation to the harmonic oscillator problem. I mean, of course, the wave functions are well known, et cetera, et cetera, especially for the ground state. But if you were to approximate that sort of problem, basically you can uh, do this procedure just with a single parameter. So that's one possibility. But on the other hand, um, actually this method is used in physical chemistry to approximate say ground states of molecules. And what they do is to basically define or propose uh, wave functions with a large number of parameters. So I mean, basically you give a so-called trial wave function with many parameters, you propose it, and then the parameters are basically tweaked or changed to get the function with the lowest energy over the family. And basically the indication of how to tweak the parameters is equivalent to say how to solve the minimization problem of the energy of uh, that it, it is now a function of parameters, given the restriction that you have made of wave functions belonging to this family defined by a parameter. So, well, at this point, the way to take the parameter is basically how to solve the minimization problem. And I mean, it makes sense for a small number of parameters. I mean, this can be done mathematically, right? For a large number of parameters, I mean, that becomes tedious to do by hand and you probably need some numerical methods to solve it um, or to solve the problem when the number of parameters is large. Um, so we'll actually yeah, talk more about um, the first case. We'll probably get uh, homework problems that talk about both cases, so um, bear with me. Now, the last piece on the cake, because at this point, yeah, we can solve the minimization problem and present the best candidate for the family. But, um, well, I mean, we want to be giving not only an upper bound, but at least to intuitively think that we're not too far away from the ground energy, right? Um, so usually what it's good to do is to choose a family of functions where your physical intuition makes the selected family of functions reasonable or a good initial guess. Um, well, for example, let's say that you're working with a potential in 1D, right? It's not the harmonic oscillator. Yet, a Gaussian would be a reasonable proposed candidate for the ground state because you know from a storm little theory, assuming you know things are well behaved, that essentially the eigenfunction related to the lowest energy, like the ground state, it's going to have no nodes inside the domain. So, the Gaussian is not a bad guess. And then you also have normalization conditions, etc. So even if it's not exactly a Gaussian, like the ground state um, uh, 
for that potential, which might be different from the harmonic one. It's not a bad guess. And it's motivated by intuition and also mathematics regarding a storm legal theory that you saw in your ODEs or PDEs course. So um, that's um, basically what I'm trying to um, mention in terms of intuition, right? I mean, it has to be a family of functions where your physical intuition tells you that that's a good candidate for a possible ground state uh, wave function family. So again, formally speaking, the, me the variational method or the rayleigh reitz method, it's just giving you an upper bound. So this is basically the variational principle, right? It's just telling you that it will be greater or equal than the energy of the ground state. But the point is that if you propose good candidates uh, in the family of wave function uh, for that space, you actually might be close. Um, so, uh, well, I'm just going to mention a quote from Griffiths um, that basically in the context of the, in particular context of physical chemistry, even if uh, the wave function uh, has little resemblance to the true one, uh, you often get very close values to the energy of the ground state. Uh, or its approximation via, you know, the energy as a function of parameters. Now, I'm not a physical chemist, but I'm a mathematician and I'm going to try to give an argument on why that would happen. And it kind of makes sense because, well, let's say that you have a family of functions defined by parameters, right? And they might not be necessarily um, a vector space, but in the case they were, for example, in the simplest case, just to give the intuition of why that happens. What you're doing by increasing the number of parameters, you're increasing the number of dimensions of your space. And so you're providing approximations to functions with a finite number of members, which are the base functions, uh, bilinear combinations, for example, if you were to mix them that way. If the final function was basically a linear combination of, of, uh, of a finite number of, 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 uh, of functions, but by increasing the number of parameters, you increase the degrees of freedom. And by that, of course, you're going to expect to approximate better and better a possible candidate for a function. So uh, loosely speaking, which I mean, of course, restricts only for the case where you have a vector space actually, and you're increasing by um, adding parameters the dimensionality of the space. It makes sense because you are giving more degrees of freedom for the family of functions to approximate better another function, which might not belong to it, but you're minimizing the distance. So this is the intuition from the point of view of um, minimization problems and uh, your parameters uh, uh, increasing the dimensionality of the space for that uh, problem. So in any case, um, one final comment, which we'll present uh, later on, is that actually the variational principle uh, and the rayleigh reitz method can be used to find not only um, bound for an excited state, but also, well, sorry, not only for a bound for a ground state, but for the excited state, provided that there are some assumptions uh, being satisfied. And that's actually a problem in Griffiths that I'm gonna present uh, on how to solve it. So, but that will be after this little example. So this is the first example. Mm. Know how to use the variational method um, that is inspired by the variational principle. And the particular problem that it's going to tackle is the harmonic oscillator. So we're going to apply the variational method to obtain basically an approximate ground energy for the harmonic oscillator. And we're doing it actually because we know the function. So in principle, there would be no reason to do it. But what we're trying to do is to double check. It, this is a sanity check to see that the method actually works and to see how far away we will get from the true ground state energy because we know it. So that's the purpose of the exercise. So from the beginning, we know that the energy of the ground state is basically h bar omega over two. And we also know that the ground state function is a Gaussian. So what we're gonna do is actually propose a family of functions with one parameter that is gonna be a positive uh, value this is the parameter a greater than zero, where the functions look like this. 
this is just related to a normalization. This is basically a parabola that is zero um, at minus a and a. And in the interval minus a to a, it's basically this truncated parabola, right? So this is my basically piecewise polynomial approximation to Gaussians. And it's trying to resemble the behavior of the Gaussian, right? It's non-zero over a finite width, and then it becomes zero. So it's not literally a Gaussian, it's a truncated parabola, but it's a polynomial approximation to the Gaussian and it's trying to perhaps uh, make things more manageable in a way. So anyways, um, the functions are normalized from the beginning. You just have to calculate this to know the exact constant, but by these definitions, they're uh, normalized. And again, the truncated parabolas resemble Gaussians uh, over the domain. They are non-zero over uh, given width, and then they basically become numerically zero. So what we're gonna do is, well, this is find the functions defined by a parameter A, and we want to find the value of A uh, that minimizes the energy over the family of functions considered. Basically, you want to find the value of A whose function psi A is the one whose energy is minimal. So um, just being proper into how to define this as an optimization problem, A naught would be the argument that minimizes the energy. Uh, so over all values or parameters A greater than zero, you want to find the value A naught, which is the argument of the energy that minimizes it. And so just to write equivalently, since, well, this is a function of one variable, basically it's the energy over these family of functions defined therefore um, up to a parameter. And this is just the definition of the energy, uh, which is basically that the average of the Hamiltonian over the uh, family of functions considered or proposed as wave functions. Then the energy at uh, A naught is precisely the minimum value of the energy over the family of functions, which are defined by the parameter A where A is positive. So again, it's the minimum value of the average Hamiltonian uh, over the family of functions uh, defined by a parameter A positive. And just remember, we are dealing with a harmonic oscillator problem, although we know the solution. It, this is basically to double check if the method works correctly and how it works and how, uh, how far away the provided approximation to the ground state is from the actual value, the true value. So again, A naught is the argument that minimizes the energy. Uh, it's gonna be considered an optimization parameter. Minimization problems are basically optimization problem. I mean, the difference between a minimization and maximization is a minus sign, right? So, um, well, the energy at A naught is a minimum value over the formula functions. Which is a Hamiltonian. And again, given that this is a minimization problem in one variable, this is basically a calculus problem, um, where of course you have to consider the boundary values and uh, well, you will have to compare and actually analyze for the problem what is the boundary, right? In a way, well, the parameter here is positive, so the boundary is basically zero infinity. Um, and we'll see that actually the energy blows up when you go to those values, but never mind. In any case, um, so what we're gonna do first is to find the normalization constant. So here mathematically the wave functions are defined of course, but we just find to find the actual value. So, I mean, the uh, square of the constant below, it's basically the integral from minus a to a of the parabola squared. So we're integrating, integrating just uh, over minus a a because the function is zero outside given the way we defined it. And well, uh, this function is even, so this will be twice the integral from zero to a. And at this point, you have this parabola, so which is a squared. So you just have to square the term and calculate integrals, right? So this is basically the square of a binomial, which is presented here. And once the terms are broken down into simple power functions, you can just integrate, right? And so this is why for x to the fourth, you get the x to the fifth divided by five. Then you have a minus two a squared factor times uh, x cubed over three related to this term. And this is just an integral dx. So this is x 
and then you evaluate from uh, zero to A. Uh, the zero values vanish, of course, because these are powers and uh, everything will be proportional to A to the fifth. It's just that you are gonna pick up some uh, constants. So here one fifth and minus two uh, over three, and then basically one. And uh, well, there are many ways to do this, right? First of all, you can add these two terms together because they, they will give you plus one third. Then you have these two. And if you add them, you get eight over 15. And uh, multiplying the eight by two, you get uh, that the value of this constant is uh, 16 a fifth divided by 15. So, I mean, this was for this integral, but you have the square root and inverted. So that's why the normalization constant over here is actually square root of 15 divided by 16 times a to the fifth power. And this is uh, multiplying the truncated parabola from minus a to a. And I mean, this is just a sanity check, uh, verifying that um, the wave function is normalized, um, which of course happens because that's the way precisely we chose this constant. <clears throat> and of course, having made sure then that the wave function is normalized, we simply, um, well, calculate the energy over uh, this family of functions, which is defined up to a parameter. So again, it's the average of the Hamiltonian over this, uh, parameterized functions by a single parameter A. And well, here you'll get basically this constant squared. That's why you get 15 divided by 16 A to the fifth. Then you substitute for the remaining part of these functions, which is A squared minus X squared. And then you have the Hamiltonian, which has the kinetic theory part and the potential part. So, well, Again, we have to remember that this is basically truncated parabolas. Actually, I would I like to add some um, clarification to avoid confusion. And right, well, this might be too formal, but never mind. I mean, just want to emphasize that we're not getting um, the parabola over the whole minus infinity infinity, but that we are having truncated parabolas, right, again. So, uh, well, parabolas are uh, second order polynomials. Uh, so their second derivative will be a constant. And I mean, given that you have truncated parabolas, actually the second derivative will be piecewise constant, but we're gonna integrate over minus a a anyways. So that's gonna make simpler calculations as you will see in a second for a couple of reasons. So the first one is okay. I simply substitute the Hamiltonian, take constants out. Then I have second derivative applied to this function integrating over minus AA. And this hand I have the potential uh, where the constant M the, uh, omega squared over two is out. And then I have X squared. So, uh, okay. If you look at the functions, basically, okay, I have to integrate from minus a to a because outside of this uh, interval, everything is zero. So I have a squared minus x squared, and then I have second derivative of the parabola. So this is the part where sometimes uh, terms will become simpler because actually over this interval where things do not vanish, well, the second derivative is minus two. So that actually reduces the complexity. On the other hand, I have basically x squared sandwich between uh, the wave function. So I have this term squared and then I have x squared. I could actually put things inside the square such as in this way, x multiplying the parabola and then all these squared, or I can simply expand, which actually will be the easiest solution. Um, so, okay, so far so good. Here, uh, what I'm gonna do is to basically multiply this factor of minus two from what it's outside. So I, that's why I get h bar squared over m, canceling the two and the minus. Um, here, yeah, here what I'm gonna do is to basically noticing that uh, this is an even function. This is the same as twice the integral from zero to a. Because again, this is the parabola, which is even. And in this case, uh, what I did was simply multiply the x by the parabola 
And then I'm gonna expand and also the argument that, well, this is a squared, so it's an even function. So this is equal to twice the interval from zero to A. So at this point, I can proceed with the calculations on this side because this is just the interval of a parabola from zero to A. So this term is simple, this is A cubed. Your one is basically minus A cubed over three. Uh, of course, don't forget the factor of two that came from the change of domain in the integral. Uh, here, I also have the factor of two, which is gonna vanish uh, with the two in the denominator. That's why I have m omega squared. And I simply expand the, x square, the squaring here before I compute anything. So that's why I have uh, basically a binomial expansion with the power two uh, squared plus a squared minus uh, double product. And um, yeah, at this point in this sum and what you have is a simplification, three thirds minus one third equal to two thirds, multiplying by the constants uh, that are appropriate. And here, this is just uh, an integration of power functions where you have three different summons. Again, everything will be proportional to basically um, the seventh power. And x squared corresponds to x cubed over three by integration, then uh, x squared x uh, to the fifth divided by five, x to the sixth power to x to the seven divided by seven, and then evaluate from zero to a. So there are some um, factorization happening in this side where I have four divided by three and then appropriate constants. Then I have m omega squared. Uh, everything is factorized by a to the seventh in this uh, term. And then I simply have one third minus two fifths plus one over seven. Uh, if I basically add these two terms, um, this will be minus one over 15. Just do the fraction in your head. Sorry, too many emails. And um, well, uh, I simply have to take the difference between one seventh minus one over 15. Um, here, this term is almost in its final form. If I do the reduction of this, basically I get eight divided by uh, the product of seven times 15. And uh, there will be a further vanishing with the normalization constant. If you notice that basically here, I have eight, here I have 16, here I have seven times 15, here I have 15, here I have three, and here I have four. If you do that uh, term by term, actually you'll see that you get a factor of five over four for this. And for the other, basically you get one over 14 plus this. Now, that is fractions at this point. The interesting thing is, well, this is a function of one variable. And what you're doing is an optimization problem with one parameter. In this case, the parameter is A and the function is the energy. So you're minimizing the energy over values of A. If you notice the dependence of the energy function of A, you'll see that it's uh, inverse proportional to A squared. And it's also proportional to A squared in the second summit. So the reason I'm emphasizing this is because if you go to either zero or infinity, each one of these terms might blow up in the different cases. So we have to minimize the energy as a function of the parameter A going to either zero or infinity makes the function blow up. So clearly the minimum must be inside the domain zero infinity and it must be a critical point because except for the singularity point, this is quite smooth. So clearly the minimum cannot be either at zero or infinity because it's going to infinity in both cases, right? So the way we can directly find the minimum in this case for this function is by finding the critical points of A. So we simply take the derivative of the energy with respect to A and make it equal to zero. Uh, one term will be simple, of course, this is uh, the one that basically derivative is 2a multiplying all else, which is why you get the seven in the denominator. And the other is basically the derivative of uh, a to the minus two, which is why you have minus two a to the minus three. And this is equal to zero. So you can pass the minus thing to the other side and basically pass also the cubic uh, thing to the other term. So that's why you get m omega squared over seven times a to the fourth power equal to five h bar squared divided by two m. And well, if you take basically the fourth root, uh, you'll get uh, that by combining the terms, right? So seven times five is 35, then you still have the factor of two, then you have the m squared omega squared combined, etc. Um, but well, there are a couple of points. By assumption, we started 
thinking that A was positive, so no negative roots will be considered, and especially because you're taking the fourth power, I mean, uh, formally you would have even like complex roots, but the point is that A is assumed as real value from the beginning as well, so you discard also that uh, uh, set of solutions. So you only keep uh, the real positive solution, which is one among the four roots, and um, basically this is the only possible solution given the assumptions. And again, the value of A that minimizes the energy that you found by uh, solving the critical problem given the values at the boundary is basically A naught equal to this value. It's the fourth root of uh, 35 H omega squared divided by two M squared times omega squared. Uh, since all the A's are positive, it's uh, equivalent to define its square since there is a one, one correspondence for basically the positive part of the real numbers. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna define what is A naught squared because uh, the square appears commonly in the calculations when we have to recover actually the energy value. So basically that would be taking just the square root instead of the fourth root. So that's why you have uh, a square root of 35 over two and some other factors have simplified where you have simply H bar over uh, M omega. So now that you know the value that minimizes the energy, you can simply plug in. So this is the argument, and you just want to compute the minimum energy over the uh, family of functions considered. And then you'll compare with the real ground energy. That's the point of the exercise, right? So we go over this. This is the way the function was defined. I simply have to plug in A naught squared in these two terms, which is what I'm gonna do here which is why I cared about this uh, square instead of A naught. So in this case, I simply plug in the value of this, square root of 35 over two times H bar divided by M omega. And then basically the inverse of this one, right? Which is why I have the term slipped. Um, if I do some simplification of this, well, there are a couple of things I can notice. First of all, some powers of the H bar go away. Um, likewise, we are related to omega, so everything is proportional to h bar omega, so, so far so good. Uh, the second thing is, um, well, uh, you might be suspicious of why I basically, when I first simplify this, each term I make it proportional to h bar omega over two. The reality is that I know that I will be close to h bar omega over two, so that's why I'm keeping this term outside. And uh, well, I put the remaining constants inside. So here, that's why I have a five squared. And then basically, I'll, well, four is two times two. So I have a two over here. So I have to introduce a two, but it must be squared. And likewise, on this side, basically I will introduce the seven, which is why I have the seven squared inside. If I do some simplification, well, here I have the reduction to a single two. Then I divide the basically five over 35, which is why I give uh, one of, uh, over seven. And then I have the five alone. So on the other hand, uh, here I also divide and um, this is two times seven and then five in the numerator. And actually, I mean, this is beyond quantum mechanics. This is more like a calculus comment, but in these minimization problems, the solutions usually symmetrize the two terms as you're noticing here, right? because I basically have the five uh, over the product of seven times two square root in both summons. So I have twice this value. Um, it's better to just uh, introduce the two inside and uh, that would be two squared, which uh, simplifies partly with this. And then I have the two, which is why I have the two times five, which is the square root of 10 divided by seven. And if I do the computation of this term, this is basically around uh, 1.2. Not exactly, but it's close. So this is why I, where I wanted to get and where I preserve uh, very preciously the H bar omega over two, because the minimum value of the energy over the family of functions that I considered is basically H bar omega divided by two times this factor, which is close to 1.2. And so I know that this is actually the true value of the ground state energy. So what I'm trying to present is that with approximation of the Gaussian via truncated parabolas, which is um, basically my polynomial, piecewise polynomial approximation, 
I'm not exactly at the ground state, but I'm also not that far away. I mean, first of all, again, strictly speaking, interpreting the variational um, method in terms of the variational principle, this is an upper bound. So that is proof because this energy is above the ground state, right? Now, how far above? It depends, of course, for the purposes of the application, etc. But it's only far above from the true ground state in terms of basically ground state energy units or h barometer or h barometer over two units, just by a factor of 0.2. So yeah, I'm far, but well, I mean, um, I guess I was not expecting to do better with a truncated polynomial or a truncated uh, parabola approximation. So in my personal opinion, it's not such a bad guess. So yeah, we emphasize that uh, the variational principle is telling you that you get an upper bound. The technique of the variational method is basically to formulate the calculation of the ground state as a minimization problem in an easy parameter space. Well, easy if you choose easy enough family of functions, but also they not only have to be easy to, I guess, manipulate or calculate, but they have to be physically close to the ground state in the same way the truncated parabolas were approximating the behavior of the Gaussian that it's non-zero in a given region. And then outside, the Gaussian is for all purposes numerically zero, outside basically plus minus three standard deviations. And so the truncated parabola is like, well, I'm a polynomial, I'm gonna make the function outside my domain zero anyways, since what the Gaussian numerically, that sort of happens. So, well, it's trying to defend the choice that we made uh, regarding the the, the proposed approximations, and it's not giving a bad result. So again, it's an upper bound, but it's not far away from the true ground state. So that's one um, result. The uh, other exercise that I want to present, it's partly theoretical, partly um, practical. So I think it's good. And it's again related to the excited state. Hmm. So it's basically a corollary to the variational principle. And in the beginning, it might seem too abstract or perhaps not, not as useless, but actually it's not uh, useless to, to know it. And so the corollary, which is actually a problem given by Griffiths, but I'm gonna present the solution. It's uh, basically the corollary to the variational principle as follows. Let's say that you know beforehand that your wave function is orthogonal to the ground state. In that case, actually, uh, the average of uh, Hamiltonian of this wave function is an upper bound for the uh, first excited state. So again, E F E is a notation for the energy of the first excited state. Now, I'm gonna present the solution and the intuition behind this. So the intuition of the proof, because I mean, in a way, this is like, a, the small proof uh, secondary to the variational principle, that's why it's called a corollary. So under the assumption that the wave function has no component along the ground state, basically the probability of being in the ground state for this state is zero because the probabilities are norm squared of the components which are the projections along given basis functions. So because the probability of being in the ground state is zero, when you compute the energy average for this wave function, the ground state is not gonna be included because the probability of being in that state is zero. And so you're not giving any weight to that value. And so the lowest value considered on the list of values over which you're taking the average is actually the, ener the energy of the first excited state. So that's why this actually is an upper bound, but for the first excited state, because the ground state is disregarded since the probability of being in the ground state is zero given the orthogonality assumed from the beginning. So uh, the proof, once you explain the intuition follows very similarly for uh, the set, uh, type of calculations that we did for the variational principle. And so the sketch of the proof is pretty much here. Um, the formal calculation is quick and it's the following. So basically you assume that you, um, have a wave function orthogonal to the ground state. So it means that it has no component along the ground state. And therefore, when you make the linear combination of the wave function in terms of eigenfunctions, 
is the sum over all states not equal to the ground state. So you're disregarding it because you know that you have no component from the beginning. All these are eigenfunctions and the sum over these coefficients where you don't take uh, in account the ground state is one because it has no component along it. Now, I mean, just as a quick comment, actually, I mean, uh, this uh, principle and the corollary allows the generacy if you understand that the ground state refers to index or indices of the ground energy. So the extension for the generate cases of the uh, ground state energy, it can be done if you define appropriately what's the eigenspace, what you have to be orthogonal. Uh, basically, this would be orthogonal to the whole degenerate eigenspace in case you had degeneracy of the ground state, etc. But I mean, we don't care too much about that. It's just being formal. Um, so the average of the Hamiltonian over the wave function that you have considered, it's basically, since you did not include the ground state, uh, plugging in this representation of the wave function where the sum and excludes the ground state. And then you apply the Hamiltonian operator. And then when you apply it, of course, you obtain the eigenvalues for each one of the summons. And again, you basically apply a linearity in the first argument, say squalinearity or anti-linearity in the second argument, which is where you get the CK conjugate or CK star. Then you have, again, these inner products, which you know that are orthonormal and recovering the direct delta and then compressing all this sum into a single term gives you CN start, the conjugate. And well, this is actually pretty nice because you recover again the probabilities norm squared of uh, CN amplitude coefficients times the energy. And so this is telling you that the average of the Hamiltonian for this type of wave function where you have no component along the ground state is basically the sum over the terms, which is just formalizing what we expected from the intuition. Now, we know that the energy uh, over this uh, sets of values considered because they are not including the ground state is strictly greater than the energy of the ground state because n is not equal to the ground state. And in, well, that's why I made the considerations of how you can include the generacy. You just have to be careful. So uh, basically the inequality is strict for this case and not equal to the ground state index or indices. And so you actually have um, non-strict inequality when um, you refer to the energy of the first excited state, right? So you're not the ground state, but you could be the first excited state and therefore you consider that case and then you have equality in that possibility, but you also could be at a second excited state, etc. So you have a greater equal. And again, the lowest value the energy can take in this sum, since you're not summing over the ground state, is uh, the energy of the first excited state. So in that case, if you consider this average, which is the sum over states that are not the ground state, well, this is greater equal than the energy of the first excited state given the considerations above. This is a constant over all terms, which you can take out. This is one because we proved it via probabilities over here. Well, actually this is by assumption, but it's common sense given the sum we're taking. And well, this compresses to one and therefore the average Hamiltonian over functions which are thrown out to the ground state is greater or equal than the energy of the first excited state. So yeah, it's a nice cute uh, secondary proof to the variational principle for this specific case. It would seem that the usefulness of this is um, amounting to the usefulness of this assumption, right? So like, well, cool, but what if I don't have this? Well, so the point of um, this assumption is the following. So, well, on one hand, yeah, in general, if you can find a trial function that is thrown out to the ground state. But the point is that for the case where in this Hamiltonian, the potential is even, the ground state would be even. And therefore, if you choose an odd function, by symmetry or anti-symmetry when you integrate any odd function provided that the potential is even will integrate to zero because the ground state will be even too and therefore you can know beforehand that you have a wave function orthogonal to the ground state if psi is odd for the particular case of an even potential so even without having calculated the problem this is just a symmetry consideration so again 
uh, for this particular case where you have a, an event potential, you can satisfy this assumption by just proposing an odd function or odds function or odd functions as the family of functions. So this is trying to give the proper value to this theorem. So it's valuable uh, for given problems where you have even potentials and where you propose adequate families of function. And so the final part of this problem, it's basically um, to find the best bound on the first excited state for the one dimensional harmonic oscillator with this trial function. So for the harmonic oscillator, yes, I know that we already know the solutions, but there are two things. First of all, it's an even potential. Second of all, if I propose this function, which is odd, it's integral when I take inner product with the ground state because it's a Gaussian will be zero by symmetry due to this term or anti-symmetry. And so in a way it's a good candidate to use for the color variable. If you remember better the harmonic oscillator, you actually will see something for this, but I want to save it for the end. So I'm not gonna mention it right now. So basically let me propose these as trial functions, which are odd functions. And by the way, this normalization constant is not independent of P because the condition that the norm of this function is one will determine A in terms of P. That's why I'm adding the dependence over here. Um, well, in principle, B is any non-negative parameter to avoid uh, blowing up to infinity. Um, actually, B has to be positive. I'll just show uh, why uh, in a second. Um, and again, these functions are orthogonal to the ground state, which in principle is an even function, even if you don't solve the uh, eigenproblem. So you'll know that you have orthogonality. We actually know that the ground state is a Gaussian for the harmonic. So it's clear that that will be vanishing in this case for this uh, side B functions. And we can apply then the corollary of the theorem. So basically the average of the Hamiltonian over this family of functions is greater or equal than the energy of the first excited state. So again, um, what we're gonna do now is basically estimate an upper bound for the energy of the first excited state with the rayleigh reeds method. So first things first, of course, we have to find the normalization constants. So, and I just want to make a quick comment that in the case where B is equal to zero, well, this exponential is equal to one then you have AX, but in this case, the domain is actually from minus infinity to infinity. So that is not normalized and we'll simply discard it, you know? So I'm just gonna focus on B positive. So when B is positive, you have the norm of uh, norm squared of these objects. So I have this, so this is norm A squared, it comes out. And then you have the integral of from minus infinity to infinity of X squared E to the minus two B X squared DX. So. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what I have here is um, this integral and I'm gonna do it by integration by parts. So, I mean, think of this, this is a Gaussian, but most importantly, the argument in the exponential is proportional to X squared. So if I were to take the derivative of, uh, sorry, of this term, uh, oops, yeah, of this term only, I would pick up a factor of proportional to X. And so it's better if in our minds, we basically separate X squared in terms of X times X because X will be our U variable and then, or B variable if you want. And X times this exponential will be basically our DU. So if this is the U, then basically by integrating U is proportional to this exponential with a normal, well, with a factor of minus four B to make things appropriate in the integration to balance out the concepts. So if you take the derivative of this, basically you get minus four B X times this exponential, which cancels with the minus four B. And that's why you get the X times this. But anyways, um, integration by parts tells you that you have basically the other function times this integrated from minus infinity to infinity, which goes to zero because of the exponential and then minus BDU, or in this case, UDB. So you have this function and then the X. So 
this is basically proportional to the integral of a Gaussian. This vanished, as we mentioned. Then we have minus minus plus. And then, okay, I'll take the factor four B out. But also, I mean, it's clear that I have to do a change of variables to put things uh, very nicely. So if I basically factorize by square root of two B and then squared, I get this same term, which is telling me the transformation in X that I have to do. I have to multiply and divide by square root of two B. And so, well, I have this factor coming from this transformation to balance this term, but also this is simply a very clean integral just in terms of Y, where Y is basically this variable. Now, at this point, everything reduces to calculate the integral of the Gaussian. And I know, first of all, that you can use a symbolic solver to find this or tables of integrals. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I just want to present, if you're curious on how to do it analytically, how you can do it by yourself. You don't need a computer, you don't need a book. You can do it on your own. And this is a very famous trick in calculus books. If you haven't seen it, you can find it in a Spiebeck sp sp book, I think. And so the trick amounts to the following. So I have this integral, which is the square root of, it's a square, which is the product of it times itself, right? So, so far so good, this is trivial. Now. The point is that I'm gonna interpret this as basically a Fubini theorem and just um, combine these two thinking of integration in terms of two variables. And so this is an integral over R2 of minus Y squared plus Z squared of this. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because this has a nice interpretation when I interpret this as an integration in R2 of um, basically not only an integration in two variables, but an integration of a radial function, which in this case is R squared, if I think I'm in 2D space, and R squared is equal to Y squared plus Z squared. And so I put everything in terms of polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. So that's why I have R D theta and then dr, and then the same, and the radial integrals goes uh, from zero to infinity and the angular from zero to two pi. So I'm basically doing this same integration, but in polar coordinates. Now, uh, at this point, this is actually uh, quite simple because, well, the change of variables to radial coordinates basically gave me the derivative of the argument of the exponential. So that's pretty nice. If I think it, um, or if I think about it, I can basically balance multiplying by the appropriate factors of basically, well, what would be my derivative minus two r? Well, multiply by minus two and then divide by basically minus two. So here I have an integral that can be done basically by separating variables, which is analytically solvable. This is simply the derivative um, of the e to the minus r squared from zero to infinity. And this is a very simple integral uh, from zero to two pi of d theta. So I have a factor of two pi then I have the remaining factor. Then I have basically the integral of e to the minus r squared from zero to infinity and all this is square root. Now, uh, basically I have a minus, don't forget it. And well, if I multiply, well, first of all, there's a two cancellation, then the minus minus, and then I have a square root of five. And this is the result of analytically doing this Gaussian. Maybe you saw it, I'm pretty sure you probably saw it in one class or possibly by another method, but this is a very elegant way, which is easy to remember on how to compute this Gaussian. In any case, I'm just um, trying to do uh, the calculation from the backbone. And so, we started from here, right? So one is equal to norm a squared of this integral, which we reduce to these factors times this integral, where I include the factor of square root of pi. So at this point, uh, I can simplify things. And of course I put the two in an elegant form, which is two squared accounting for the four. And if I pass to the other side, I basically have four B and then I incorporate uh, pi enter B in the same square root now uh, inverted and expresses the one half. If I want to put basically um, the four and the B inside the square root, oh, I have, that's why I have the two squared. And then that's why I have two to the fifth inside and then B squared times B, B cubed. So never mind. Um, if I want to choose basically, well, this is for norm A squared, right? Which I usually you don't care too much about the faces. So we'll take this as A squared. Uh, which amounts to a choice of phase, which is A depending on B in 
the form of a square root of all this, which is why I expressed these things inside the square root. So this is to the fourth um, um, root. So, well, uh, some things can be simplified. We're actually, I can simply take the two outside and then I have a two remaining and then I have the cubed inside because it doesn't have enough powers to go outside the fourth root. Um, but okay, now I have the form, then I have the, well, so I make the emphasis that the normalization constant depends on B. So these two parameters were not independent at the beginning. And so if I go back to this expression, I simply have calculated what is A in terms of B and the result is here. So, um, okay, so far so good. Basically uh, what I have done so far is to normalize the wave functions. I want to find the function of the energy in terms of the parameter B, which, okay, it's the average of H uh, with respect to the wave function psi B. Of course, there will be a norm of A squared coming out, and then I have this um, inner products, right? So inner product of the other part without the constant times the Hamiltonian, kinetic plus potential, and then the remaining part of the function. So since I have calculated norm of A squared, I simply use that over here, actually this form, which might be simpler. So 4B times this square root. And then I have this term. And okay, uh, look, uh, how to make my life easier comes with many exercises and many calculations. So I'm gonna give you the hint on how I can make my life easier with this. Of course, I can take the constants out, that's fine, that's assumed. But the point is that this term could be handled basically by integration by part. Because essentially, well, what you have is, okay, except for constants, this function multiplied by the der second derivative of this other function. If you basically integrate by parts, you will have boundary term minus this term, and then you pass the derivative or one derivative to the other side. So what you have is basically a plus sign coming from the integration by parts. The boundary terms will vanish that I know because I'm dealing with exponentials, et cetera, and the integrations from minus infinity to infinity. And then I have passed the derivative to the other side. So again, the plus accounts from the integration by parts, boundary terms will vanish, and this looks way more manageable. Not only because I have passed one derivative, but these are exactly the same term. And so this is the same function squared. For the other, I have x squared, uh, a sandwich between this for the inner product. Um, yeah, so I will have to expand eventually, so that's not a problem. But anyways, I take the constants out, h bar squared over 2m, then I have the integral of this term squared, which is what I tried to make my life easier instead of calculating multiple stuff. Then I have this, um, well, so what I'm doing is basically giving an x to this, an x to this, that's why I have x squared times this, and then squared, which I will have x to the fourth I was expecting, and then e to the minus two b x squared. Now, um, yeah, so, okay, let's see. Yeah, this is just expansion, x to the fourth, e to the minus two b x squared. Um, this is an integral from minus infinity to infinity. I mean, I can express it also as, uh, twice the integral from zero to infinity because this is uh, squared. So it's an even function, which is making this factor of two go out. And likewise in this case. Um, so you have m omega squared, the integral from zero to infinity, and then h bar squared over m integral from zero to infinity. Now, um, here, yeah, so let me follow. Okay, following the calculation, I have to take derivative before I square. So the first one is easy, just take out the x and the other you have the same function times the derivative of the argument of exponential. So that's why you have minus two bx and then combined with the other x gives you the x squared in here. And then you have to square all this stuff. Uh, here you're fine. Um, here you take basically squares, uh, basically binomial theorem, square of uh, one, square of the other minus uh, double product of this times this. Um, so that's good. And yeah, trying to make my life easier uh, 
So I have to do these calculations at the very end, right? And then that's pretty normal. So, okay, one thing to notice is that actually this integral resembles this one except for this factor. So, and of course, some other terms. So it's easier if I combine these two terms in a single one, this factor accounting for this, this factor accounting for this other part. And then I have only two integrals on this side. So again, trying to make my life easier. This one is easy because this is in terms of a Gaussian, or at least I know the result, which I calculated by hand the bow. Then this part resembles something that I obtained. I'll make the point in a second. But anyways, um, it actually might be easier if I return to the integrals from minus infinity to infinity instead of the zero to infinity. So I just have a factor of one half when I go back to the original domain, but never mind. And uh, yeah, so this is why I have the four here and the two here. So I return to minus infinity to infinity. And here I have the integral from zero to infinity. So again, my, uh, I'm insistent in the fact that we computed two of the three terms above already. So this was very similar to something we calculated. So if you remember, we picked up the factor of the square root of pi and we had this in the denominator. We combined them, we have this. On the other hand, this is basically, except for a factor of uh, the change of variable square root of 2b, this is basically the integral of the Gaussian. So this is the square root of pi divided by 2b, excuse me. And so two of these terms are calculated. Um, yeah, we're just uh, we're gonna plug in these values. This one, um, so this one over here, this one related to this one over here, which we just choose that this is the better form. And yeah, well, um, let's see. We're just missing this term. So everything else has been put in terms of the parameter of optimization. And well, we just have to compute this integral. So there is a simplification of this in terms of, well, there's a factor of 2b canceling. Um, in fact, not only there is a canceling, but there is a full cancellation because essentially this is this term minus itself. So this term amounts to zero and we just have to compute this part, multiplying of course by the appropriate factor. Uh, so to, how to compute the last integral? Well, actually we'll do again integration by parts, but don't be afraid we don't have to go to the last term in the, I mean, we don't have to integrate by parts many times. We just have to be careful and eventually we'll get an easy term and actually related to something we did before. So if I consider this basically, okay, I have X to the fourth, which is X cubed and then exponential and then this, right? So Again, I'm balancing uh, by multiplying and dividing by the factor that I would have if I take derivative of exponential. So at this point, this is indeed an integration by parts where this is the differential and this is the other term. So um, basically, okay, I still have the normalization factor and I have this outside Then I have u times b. So far so good because this was my db and then I have uh, basically b du and I have 3x squared dx. So on one hand this term vanishes at the boundary because you have an x term here then you have infinity where the Gaussian goes to zero so you only consider this term uh, but this actually this is actually equal to something we did before right so we did before this integrals of x squared e to the minus 2 bx squared so you have the result and we can only plug it in. Most importantly, this is an even function. And so here we have from minus infinity to infinity, here we have zero to infinity. So this is basically half this value, which is why we have this square root of pi divided by two. Uh, so uh, if we factorize properly, we have the four B squared, then we have some cancellation. Um, uh, yeah, so we have three over two, four B squared and the square root. So I can plug in this value and I'm basically get my final answer just to get the form of the function. But I mean, once I get the function, I can simply minimize as in calculus and I'm good to go. So, okay, I have this factor, then I have this, then I have this integral for which I know its value, which I simply plug in. And 
let's see. Well, there's a cancellation of a 4B factor in here outside. Um, also of this um, root with this. And uh, well, uh, you'll get a single factor of 4B times two, that's why you get the 8B. And then you have this term. But um, the important thing is, okay, when you multiply each term, basically you get one over V and again, uh, proportional to B, the second term. So, I mean, at least for these two sets of examples, it's clear what's happening, right? I mean, basically you have two terms one that blows up when B goes to zero, the other that blows up when B goes to infinity. And so the minimum value must be in the interior of the domain zero infinity and it's a finite value, it cannot be infinity. Uh, so again, we only need to look for critical points. So basically we have to take derivative of this function with respect to B and solve for the zero. So one of them is easy, of course, the linear term the other you get basically minus one over B squared times a constant. I can disregard this constant because I'm making equal to zero. So it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, if I pass the term to the other side and basically I have uh, things equal to B squared as in this form, um, where actually things are pretty nice. Uh, if you notice everything is in terms of powers of two after uh, pr properly factorizing. So if I take the square root of this, I have B equal to M omega divided by two H bar. So this is actually the single solution for this uh, problem. So the single parameter that minimizes the energy. Or again, you have a function that goes to zero and, sorry, that goes to infinity when B either goes to zero or to infinity, right? So it depends on the behavior. And uh, so you choose the point where you have the minimization of the energy. And, um, well, if you plug in this value, you get the minimum energy over the trial functions belonging to the family consider. So yeah, I mean, uh, some of this, it really depends. So, so far, uh, we have only dealt with functions of IBM parameter, but sometimes trial functions, test functions are denotation given to those spaces or functions. Um, many more uh, considerations have to be made in order to claim that they are vector spaces, especially when the number of um, parameters goes greater than one. But anyways, I guess I'm partly trying to introduce you to the annotation and there might be a homework problem related to this. So anyways, if I plug in the value of B related, so it's this one, um, M, M times omega divided by two H bar. So I have the four multiplying the B here, then the inverse multiplying over here. And then basically, if you notice after the cancellation, yeah, basically I have two H bar omega on one term and the other is two H bar omega two. So again, my comment from calculus that actually the optimization looks for this symmetric solution in a way, right? I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, but okay, you add these two and then you divide and then oh, surprise you get that the energy is three over two H bar omega, which is actually the exact energy of the first excited state of the harmonic oscillator. I mean, so why is that? In a way, there is no mystery. We chose the family of functions to be exactly of the form of the first excited state of, um, of the harmonic oscillator. The only thing that we were missing to define was basically the decay rate of the Gaussian but everything else is as we would expect from the solutions of the harmonic oscillator. The first excited state is the Gaussian or a Gaussian times a term linear to X um, proportional to X and then the normalization constant. So the only thing we are missing to define to say this is the exact first excited state of the harmonic oscillator is the B that defines the decay, the decay rate of the Gaussian and then defining B, A is defined. So in a way, there's no surprise. At the same time, we're also doing a sanity check, right? I mean, that provided with, say, the exactly final, the exact final of functions, we do recover indeed by the variational method with the minimization, uh, the exact uh, fine, uh, first excited state energy. So um, in a way, I mean, I'm not saying the problem is useless. Actually, I would 
put the problem besides the sanity check in this fashion or in this uh, scope. Let's say that you kind of like remember the way the first excited state looked like except for the decay rate of exponential. So what you're doing is to basically use the variational method to remember the form of B. And so you remember, oh yeah, it looks like a Gaussian multiplied by an X term. Of course, it has to be normalized, but I forgot what B was. Well, actually by energy minimization arguments such as the variational method, you're recovering the exact form of B and you're also obtaining exactly the energy of the first excited state. So again, in this case, it's true that we have the upper bound, but the upper bound is actually the optimal one in the sense that it's equal to the energy of the first excited state because we were very lucky enough or we actually knew beforehand which were the right trial functions to use. We propose basically something almost equal to the form of the first excited states, except for the decay rate constant, which was determined by the rayleigh ritz method. So I'm just trying to do a couple sanity checks to see how the method works, indicating that it's an upper bound, also indicating that with the proper choice of family of functions where their shape is quite reasonable in terms of physical intuition, you won't be too far away from the actual ground energy, let's say, or first excited state energy. And so I'm trying to give importance on an appropriate uh, choice of uh, the family of functions of this so-called trial space. And uh, yeah, I mean, this let us obtain for this particular case, because we kind of knew the solution from the beginning, not only an upper bound for the first excited state, but actually its exact value. So again, if you basically clean up the expression, in terms of, excuse me, knowing what is the value of V naught that not only, well, minimizes the energy or the family of functions, but it's actually coincidentally equal to the energy of the first excited state. Well, you know that uh, this is the minimizer. You just have to plug in back in the wave function ooh, over here to find the form of the exact uh, uh, wave function of the first excited state. And if you do that, this is the result that you obtain. And of course, these are only normalization constants properly written to have one fourth uh, power over here, here one half, but most importantly, the decay rate, right? In the sense of, um, well, the decay rate is B basically. So here you have B naught M omega divided by two H bar which is what you have exactly here. So I hope these uh, sanity checks were useful and a good introduction to the method of rayleigh reeds or variational method as is um, also called. Um, next class, I will present more practical examples on how to calculate uh, basically these upper bounds to the ground state energy level. And uh, yeah, I mean, so far I have mostly based my um, lecture on either Griffiths or my own set of lecture notes when I was a student. Well, I'll follow up with more examples. So have a good afternoon and see you soon.